Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Hugh Glass. I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw this name pop up as I was doing research for this video, I thought it was one of those prank names, but turns out it 100% is not, and I just suck. Anyway, Hugh Glass was an American fur trapper, trader, and hunter, as well as an explorer, which, given the time frame of his life, 1783 to 1833, we can all imagine exactly what that would have looked like if you catch my drift. If you've seen The Man in the Wilderness or the Revenant, you'll be kind of familiar with this story. So basically, Hugh and some other men were out on a fur trading adventure, and at some point in the journey, they regrouped at Fort Kiowa before setting out to Yellowstone River. But as they were searching for animals to hunt, Hugh accidentally stumbled upon and subsequently disturbed a grizzly bear who was with her two cubs, which we all know is a bad scenario. The bear charged at him, bit him, slashed him up, you know, exactly what you think happens when someone is being mauled by a bear. Despite this attack, Hugh, with the help of the other men was able to fend off this bear, but he was left with some serious injuries. The group carried him for a while, but they realized that doing this was slowing them down, and at this point they were convinced that he was going to die from his injuries. This is when the leader asked for two volunteers to stay behind with him until he passed away, and then to bury him, which two people stepped up to do. Then, because of what the two volunteers would later claim to be a sort of ambush attack, the two men grabbed Hugh's rifle and knife and basically all of his equipment, and ran out of there and went to catch up with the rest of the group, where they then falsely told them that Hugh had died. He was able to regain consciousness, but now he found himself abandoned, and he had festering wounds, a broken leg, and deep cuts on his back that exposed his bare ribs. He set the bones in his leg, he allowed the maggots in his wound to continue eating the dead flesh so as to try and prevent gangrene, which is disgusting, and then he began crawling the 200 some mile journey back to Fort Kiowa. He crawled toward the Cheyenne River where he made himself a sort of float device, and then he floated downstream towards the fort. Not only did he survive a bear attack, but then he survived after being abandoned for six weeks, and he actually made it back alive. In our number nine spot today, we have Mauro Prosperi. Mauro Prosperi is an Italian police officer who got lost in the Sahara Desert in 1994 while doing the Marathon of the Sands in Morocco. This marathon is a six-day-long endurance race in one of the most dry and barren places in the entire world. During the race, a sandstorm hit and caused Mauro to become disoriented and he lost his way. One day after going missing, he found an abandoned Muslim shrine in Algeria and he used it as shelter from the sun. He killed and ate bats to survive and for hydration he had to drink his own urine, he licked dew off of the rocks, and he sucked moisture out of the wet wipes he had with him. After failing to be seen and rescued by two different aircrafts that flew right over him, he figured he would never be found and he tried to take his own life. The heat in the desert, however, is so dry that the wounds clotted and he thankfully survived this attempt. For nine days, he walked through the desert and ate insects and reptiles. Finally, he found a small group of nomadic people, and they took him to the nearest village. From there, he was flown to the hospital, where doctors said his liver had almost completely failed. Having traveled 180 miles in total, Ross Perry lost 35 pounds in body weight, and it took years for him to fully recover. But despite all of this, he has remained an enthusiastic runner and even returned and completed the same race a few times. In our number eight spot today, we have Peter Skylberg. In February of 2012, two snowmobilers made quite the discovery when they saw a car that was trapped in the snow. They began to dig this car out, and that is when they realized that this car had a man in the back seat, and he was alive. It isn't quite clear how or why, but 44-year-old Peter somehow got his car trapped underneath all of this snow, and this is where he spent two months before the snowmobilers were able to rescue him. Two months in a trapped car. Peter told doctors that he survived without food by just eating snow and staying inside of his warm clothes and sleeping bag. The temperatures around the time of him being found were as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, which had people wondering how he didn't freeze, and this is thanks to what people referred to as the igloo effect. The snowed-in car is probably exactly what shielded him from the elements, just enough to ensure that he didn't freeze. No one is quite sure exactly how he survived, but some suspect he may have gone into a sort of hibernation. Either way, because of the snow and his adequate water intake, two months is definitely 
definitely getting close to as long as a person can go without food, so thankfully he was found when he was. In our number 7 spot today we have Michael Benson. In 1992, as Michael Benson and Chris Duddy were in a helicopter over an active volcano in Hawaii, shooting some aerial footage for a movie, the helicopter crashed. It is said that the helicopter lost power so suddenly that they didn't even have time to radio for help. This led to the two men and the pilot, Craig Hosking, being stuck inside of the volcano, just missing a bubbling pool of lava. The pilot and Chris were able to get out of the volcano not too long after the crash, but the same couldn't be said for Michael. The volcano emits a ton of noxious gases, but luckily where the men ended up was in a part of the crater that enough fresh air could also reach. Michael didn't know that the other two men were already out of the volcano, and he was extremely worried that they had perished, all the while of course being worried about his own fate. He tried to pass the time and calm himself down by reciting the alphabet backwards, he prayed, when it rained he cupped his hands to collect the drinking water, but none of this could distract him from these sudden, small eruptions and bubbling lava below. After two days with no food or sleep had passed, Michael thought he was at his end, but rescue helicopter pilot Tom Hauptman was able to see Michael through a small, momentary break in the steam before the fog all took over again. They knew where he was, but they had to go in to save him with no visibility. Almost two hours after being spotted, Michael was able to make it into the safety net where he was then lifted out of the volcano. He recalls a triumphant feeling as he left. In our number six spot today, we have Matthew Allen. Okay, when I was a kid, every time I was mad at my parents or brothers, I thought about getting a stick, tying a little handkerchief around it filled with my most precious belongings and running away forever to live a life in the wild jungles of Saskatchewan. I thought about doing that but never did because I would quickly be reminded of how I would absolutely not be able to even get down the block before turning right back around. Unfortunately, however, the same could not be said for Matthew Allen. In December of 2012, the teenager at the time, like most of us during our teenage years at some point, got tired of his parents' rules and restrictions on his life and decided to run away from home, but aside from how just running away is a terrible idea in general, the timing was also just all wrong. He ran away during a record-breaking heat wave, and after running away, the 18-year-old went missing for nine weeks. By the time he was found by some hikers, he was lost in the Australian outback, disoriented, unable to stand, and he had lost half of his body weight. He was surviving solely on creek water. He was extremely lucky to have survived for as long as he did, and he really just made it. Thank goodness for whatever led those hikers there that day, because he was cutting it extremely close. In our number five spot today, we have Jose Salvador Alvarenga. On December 17th, 2012, Jose set out on a professional fishing trip with a young fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. They planned the trip to take around 30 hours, and they were setting out to hunt tuna, mahi-mahi, and sharks. Just a few short hours into their trip, however, things went awry when a storm struck that lasted five days, and it of course blew them way off course. Jose of course radioed in to his boss to call for help, but unfortunately the radio had been totally disabled by the storm, as well as the rest of the boat's electronics, and the motor was also badly damaged. When the men didn't return, a search party was sent out, but it only lasted two days before being called off because they just assumed the men had already passed away. The two men survived by eating raw fish, turtles, and jellyfish, and they drank rainwater and turtle blood, but the weeks quickly turned to months and there was still no sign of rescue. This is when the young fisherman fell ill from the raw food diet and he sadly passed away. Jose was now on his own and he managed to survive another nine months alone at sea until he finally spotted a small island. He abandoned the boat and swam all the way to shore. He had reached the Marshall Islands and he met a local couple who immediately alerted the authorities. He survived out there for 438 days and it is estimated that he covered somewhere between 5,500 to 6,700 miles. In our number four spot today we have Douglas Mawson. Douglas was another person who was called an explorer and he was also a geologist. He is most well known perhaps for his face being on the paper 100 dollar note in Australia, but part of the reason he landed that gig is due to this story. In December of 1912, Douglas, along with two other explorers, set off on an expedition meant to explore the interior of the Antarctic, but unfortunately only pure tragedy ensued. First, one of the explorers, Belgrave Ninnis, fell into a crevasse along with most of the group's best dogs and a ton of their supplies. The other two now had to push on without most of their food and equipment in the unforgiving environment that they were in. The two fell ill with things like scurvy and they were struggling to get back to their camp and they ended up surviving for a while by eating the dogs that remained with them and then they just barely scraped by on the rest of their food portioned out with starvation rations. The other explorer, Xavier Mertz, ended up passing away from exhaustion, starvation, and 
And people also assume the possibility of toxicity from consuming the dog's liver. In the end, Doug battled the elements for about 30 days before he finally made it back to camp in February of 1913. But when he got there, he realized that he was frostbitten, skeletal, exhausted, and that he had also missed the ship that was retrieving the rest of the crew by just hours. To add a little more drama to this one, there are rumors that he may have kind of sabotaged Mertz's starvation rations that would have, quote, hastened his death so that he could consume his final companion, but that is all rumors and it has never been substantiated, so we'll just assume that that is untrue. In our number three spot today, we have Truman Duncan. In June of 2006, Truman, who was a switchman, headed in to work for another day of working on the trains. During the workday, he ended up accidentally falling and landing in between moving railroad freight cars. This ended up leaving Truman trapped under the wheels, which not only cut off his legs, but also sliced through his pelvis bone. He somehow, absolutely miraculously, stayed alive, stayed conscious, and was able to pull out his phone and call 911. Some speculate that perhaps the weight of the car is what prevented him from bleeding out, but regardless of whatever it was, it truly is incredible. He ended up losing his legs, his pelvis, and a kidney, but the most important thing is that he didn't lose his life. No one is really exactly sure how he survived, but it definitely has had to do something with Truman's ability to stay calm and call for help, even in a situation I couldn't even imagine being faced with. In our number two spot today, we have Mary Vincent. Mary Vincent's story starts out in September of 1978, when she was hitchhiking to her grandpa's house in California. She was on the side of the road with a group of other hitchhikers, which is exactly why it was weird when a blue van pulled up and the man inside claimed he could only take Mary with him. Huge red flag right there, which Mary definitely picked up on, but this being the 70s, coupled with her young young age, and the fact that she just wanted to get to her destination is what caused her to still accept the ride. As the drive went on, Mary ended up falling asleep, and when she awoke, she quickly realized the nightmare she was in, as she realized they were now in Nevada, not California. She began to panic, but the man driving assured her it was just an honest mistake. Yeah, I pick up random strangers all the time without knowing where I'm going and somehow end up in another state. Yeah, no worries, Mr. Weirdo. The next time they stopped, the man ended up attacking Mary. He then threw her out of the car and proceeded to cut her arms off with a hatchet. At this point, she was now unconscious, and he put her body, assuming she was going to or already had passed away, into a concrete pipe and down an embankment. After he left, Mary regained consciousness and realized that she could not just give up and stay there because no one would find her. She got up and climbed up to the road, all the while holding her arms up in order to slow the bleeding. She was able to flag down a car and was rushed to the hospital. She not only survived, but testified against the man in court. Mary continues to to live a happy, fulfilled life after surviving what many people would call the impossible. In our number one spot today, we have Alison Botha. Sometimes I hear a story that I truly cannot believe is real, and Mary's was definitely one of those, and Alison's story is also absolutely one of them. She is a woman unlike any other, and this survival story starts out in her home in South Africa in December of 1994. She was 27 years old at the time, and after a night out with friends, she drove back to her apartment, and when she parked her car, a man with a knife ended up forcing his way in side. The man forced her over into the other seat, and he began to drive her car with her inside to go and pick up some sort of accomplice. These two absolute monsters, who really don't even deserve to be named, took Allison to a deserted area on the outskirts of town, and did some of the most violent and disgusting things I've ever heard that I absolutely cannot repeat here on YouTube, and then they just simply left her for dead. At this moment, Allison was still breathing, despite having been disemboweled, and I'm not even making this up, despite being nearly decapitated, and not only was she still alive after these injuries, but she also said, quote, I realized my life was too valuable to let go of, and that gave me the courage to survive. This is when Allison not only wrote the names she knew her attackers by in the dirt, with I love mom below, just in case she didn't survive, but she also saw headlights in the distance, and she knew that this was her chance. She started to pull herself up, and this is when she realized how injured she really was. I kid you not, Allison held her intestines in with one of her hands and used her other hand to hold her head onto her body, and she made her way towards the headlights. Thankfully, a young veterinary student named Tian Ellard was on the road that night, and he saw Allison and stopped to help her. He used his vet knowledge to help keep her alive until emergency services arrived, and the doctor at the hospital where Allison was taken said, in reference to her injuries, that they were the most severe he's ever seen. 
Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Angela Hernandez. This story starts off in July of 2018 when a woman named Angela was driving down Highway 1 near Big Sur on her way to Southern California. While driving, a small animal ran out into the middle of the road and of course for a multitude of reasons, Angela didn't want to hit it, so she swerved. Unfortunately, this led to Angela shooting right off the edge of the cliff in her SUV, which then led to a tumble down about 200 feet to a grim area of the rocky beach. I call it a grim area because it's a place where no one visits. Of course, this entire scenario is exceptionally traumatic and severe, and it left Angela with very serious injuries. After the crash, she was suffering from a brain hemorrhage, fractured ribs, a broken collarbone, ruptured blood vessels in both of her eyes, and a collapsed lung. But despite all of these injuries, the most important thing was that she didn't die, and that she wasn't about to let her fate be sealed right there. She was initially unconscious after the crash, but when she came to, she saw water lapping over her knees. She had a multi-tool in her car that she was able to use to break out the window so she could crawl out, where she then swam to the beach and passed out again. Later, when she woke up, she realized she had no shoes and the severity of her injuries started to set in, but despite all of this, she got up and started walking. She used a hose from her car to help collect water from the dripping moss along the shore, and every time a car passed by, she tried to get their attention, but unfortunately because of where she was, no one could see her or hear her. Seven days after the crash, some hikers were out and about searching the beach for fishing spots when they came across the wreck of the Jeep. Thankfully, these people didn't stop there and continued searching for the person who belonged to the Jeep. That is when they found Angela sleeping on some rocks. They gave her water and called for help, and finally, after seven days, she was able to be rescued from this absolute nightmare situation. In our number nine spot today, we have Marco Lavoie. Marco is a person from Quebec who was headed up to the northern area of the province for a canoe trip. During this trip on the Nottoway River, he had set up camp, of course, as one does, but unfortunately, nature had some other plans for him. A bear ended up coming and raiding his camp, and while doing so, ate all of his food and destroyed his boat, which left Marco with very few supplies and his dog. Marco survived out in the wilderness for an unbelievable 90 days before he was rescued and when he was found, he was completely out of it and was delirious and was barely saying any words at all, and he wasn't with his dog anymore. After a bit of time in the hospital while healing from his injuries, he finally revealed the desperate measures he had to go to in order to survive, and that involved using his companion as food. Of course, this came under immediate scrutiny, and he received a lot of hate for the decision he made. Of course, however, we can all be upset about what happened and acknowledge how tragic the situation was, but none of us can really judge unless we've been in the same sort of dire situation. After the entire situation, survival experts began to come to the defense of Marco, saying that you have to do what you can to survive, and after a certain time, the decisions sometimes aren't even conscious ones, and it's simply just survival instincts kicking in. In our number eight spot today, we have the Miracle of the Andes. I talked about this one on another video recently because this is perhaps one of the most famous survival stories of all time, and it starts in October of 1972 when members of the Old Christians rugby team, along with members of their families and their friends, were flying to a match in Chile. The pilot made a mistake and began to descend while in the Andes, and this led to the plane striking a mountain, which sheared both of its wings off, and the plane then crashed into a remote area that has been nicknamed the Valley of Tears. The initial crash took the lives of 12 people, which left 33 survivors. A search party was initiated, but after eight days, it was called off because the conditions on the mountains were considered near unsurvivable and because the remnants of the white aircraft would be basically invisible in the snow. In order to survive, the remaining people who were stuck here had to resort to the most extreme survival methods in order to sustain themselves, which involved using those who had passed away for sustenance. In the coming weeks, six more people passed, and then an avalanche took the lives of eight more as if they hadn't already gone through enough. It is now December, remember this flight happened in October, and two of the remaining survivors set out to find help and miraculously found three Chilean men four days later. By December 23rd, all 
16 of the remaining survivors were rescued after being stranded for over two months with no food, no gear, literally nothing. If going through all of that wasn't enough, the public tried to criticize how these people went about surviving this absolutely horrifying situation, but they rightfully defended themselves and their actions. In our number seven spot today, we have Aaron Ralston. This is another one of those stories that has gone down in history as one of the most famous survival stories ever because it's truly unbelievable, but also thanks to the blockbuster movie that was made about the entire ordeal, which then brought the story to people who hadn't yet heard of it. In April of 2003, 27-year-old Aaron Ralston was climbing in Utah's Blue John Canyon when he found himself in an unfortunate situation where an 800-pound boulder fell on him. This caused his right hand to be crushed, which then left him trapped. Of course, Aaron tried everything he could to free himself, which included using his multi-tool he had on him to try and chip away at the rock, as well as trying to fashion some kind of a pulley with his climbing rope in an attempt to pull the rock away from him. After multiple failed attempts and a total of six days being stranded, Aaron realized that his only way out would likely be to amputate his own crushed hand. When describing what that was like, Aaron told National Geographic News that it was quote, a hundred times worse than any pain I've felt before. Yeah, Aaron, I truly cannot even imagine. Thankfully, this was enough to free Aaron and he was able to get the medical attention he needed and of course survived. Aaron even ended up going back to climbing after his recovery with help thanks to a special kind of prosthetic hand that has a built-in climbing pick. While we're on the topic, just a quick shout out to all those engineers and medical professionals who dedicate their lives to building prosthetic limbs for people. It's such a cool and important job and I don't feel like we recognize them enough. So thanks. In our number six spot today, we have Ernest Shackleton. Ernest is a man who braved the harsh conditions in the South Pole once, so by 1914, he was ready to do it again. He set out with a group of 28 men and they all had the intention to make it all the way across the continent to then arrive at a ship that would be waiting for them on the other side. Well, things took a bad turn almost immediately as they were on their journey to the Antarctic when they all became trapped in ice as their ship, the Endurance, fell apart. From here, they were trapped, their supplies slowly began to dwindle, and this led to the men getting aboard life rafts to then float for 14 days through the icy Antarctic seas to an island. Unfortunately, once here, this wasn't the end as the men then had to take another long journey all the way to the nearest inhabited island, which was South Georgia Island, and this took them about a thousand miles from their original point. Imagine having to float for a thousand miles, hoping you make it to where you wanna go. Despite everything the men went through on this journey, all 28 of them survived the entire ordeal, but sadly the same could not be said for some of their furry companions. Unfortunately, the men found themselves in situations similar to Marco that we discussed earlier. To make matters even worse, the ship that was waiting for the men on the other side of the Antarctic, the one that of course never ended up actually seeing the men at all, the Ross Sea Party ended up experiencing three deaths. In our number five spot today, we have Steve Callahan. Steve Callahan was a man who had just finished his successful solo journey across the Atlantic, and this insane story starts out when he was on his way back. Steve was sailing in his six and a half meter sloop in January of 1981 when a storm struck, but this didn't concern Steve as much as the hole that was left in his boat's hull from either a whale or a shark, as that was most definitely taking over his attention. The boat began to sink, and this is when Steve was quick thinking and repeatedly dove back into the sinking ship to grab as much survival gear as possible. Steve was now left on a six foot circular raft adrift in the Atlantic. At this point, he was about 800 miles west of the Canary Islands, but as time went on, he was only drifting further and further away. While lost at sea, Steve fished with a spear gun and made drinkable water using a solar still. On day 14 of being adrift, he signaled to a passing ship, but it didn't stop for him. After a month of being at sea, he was far out from the shipping lanes, and by day 50, he was really struggling to live. He was covered in sores from the salt water, he was extremely dehydrated, and there was now a hole in his raft that was getting difficult to keep patched. After 76 days had passed, Steve was exhausted and he was so thin he had lost a third of his body weight. Birds began circling his raft to try and scavenge the leftover fish guts that Steve had tossed back into the waters. And while that is really gross, 
This is actually what led to his rescue. The swirling birds led to some fishermen spotting Steve on his raft, and then they came to the rescue. Steve had lasted over two months lost at sea and managed to keep himself alive the whole time. In our number four spot today, we have Joe Simpson. Two best buddies, Joe Simpson and Simon Yates, were doing their thing, climbing throughout the Peruvian Andes when a terrible accident occurred that left Joe with a broken leg and heel. This is obviously a really big issue when climbing mountains, and it's also important to note that the climb the men were doing was a particularly difficult one, and throughout their experience, there were some very severe weather conditions that they were also facing. Simon tried to help Joe and tried to help them both get back to safety, and to do this, they tied their two ropes together to then lower Joe down the different mountain stages, all the while doing this in weather that was continually worsening. Simon lowered Joe 3,000 feet using this method, and they felt for a while like things were going to be okay, but just as they were getting relatively close to the safety of the glacier, Joe went over an unseen cliff edge while being lowered, which meant that Joe was hanging completely free with only the rope that Simon was holding keeping him from falling. Literally, his life was in Simon's hands at this moment. Joe couldn't get his weight off of the rope, and there was no way that Simon could possibly lower him any further. The two were stuck here for what was later estimated to be over an hour and a half, and the longer they stayed here, the more Simon was being pulled by Joe from his unbelayed stance. Simon was 150 feet above Joe, and who knows how far above the glacier they were aiming for. There was unfortunately only one thing they could do in order to keep Simon from falling off the side of the mountain, and that was to cut the rope. In doing so, Joe fell about 50 feet to the entrance of a crevasse, where he then fell again to a ledge within the crevasse. After cutting the rope, Simon dug himself a snow hole in the slope behind his stance, which he then spent the night in. The following day, he completed his descent to the glacier, and since he wasn't able to find Joe, he just assumed his friend had lost his life, and he returned all the way to base camp. Little did he know, however, that Joe did not lose his life, and instead he was able to climb and crawl out of the crevasse, and after after four days, he himself reached the base camp. Both of the men survived, and of course people criticized Simon for cutting the rope in the first place, but Joe understood the situation for what it was and quickly came to his defense, saying that had the roles been reversed, he would have done the same thing. There really was no other option in this scenario, and in the end, thankfully, it all worked out. In our number three spot today, we have Julianne Kopka. Miss Julianne has like a two for one when it comes to survival stories. Her story starts out on Christmas Eve 1971 when she was just a teenager and was on Lanza Flight 508. The plane was struck by lightning, which is an actual nightmare situation, and this led to the plane starting to basically disintegrate midair. If you've seen any horror movie that takes place at high altitudes where the plane gets broken, you know what happens next. In what felt like the blink of an eye for Julianne, she found herself still strapped to her seat just two miles above the Peruvian rainforest. She was injured, of course, full of bruises, had a broken collarbone, but she was alive. And in fact, she was the only person who had been on the flight that was still alive. But now she was in the wilderness alone and all she had with her was a bit of candy for food. Julianne found a small stream which she began to wade in downstream. The insects in the jungle were eating her alive and sorry this is so gross, but maggots had infected her arm. Julianne ended up coming across a sort of encampment where she found a few supplies. She was so smart and was able to give herself a little bit of first aid, which included pouring gasoline on the infected arm, which then led to all the disgusting little creatures leaving it. Just a few hours later, a few lumber workers found her, gave her more first aid treatment, and took her to an area that was more populated, where she was then airlifted for medical treatment. In 2000, her story was told through the documentary titled Wings of Hope, which was directed by Werner Herzog, who took particular interest in the story because it is obviously incredible, but he too had booked a seat on that flight and he would have been on it if it wasn't for a last minute change of plans. In our number two spot today, we have Ada Blackjack. Ada was a woman from Alaska and she was a part of the indigenous Inupiat people. She was hired by some Canadians for an expedition to the Wrangell Islands, which in current times is Russian territory, but back when this story took place in 1921, the expedition was intended to claim the islands in the name of Canada. Ada was hired to be the cook and the seamstress for the expedition and was told that she would be one of many indigenous peoples on the trip, but 
this was a lie. There were five people left on the island, including Ada, and the other four people were European, Canadians, and Americans. They first got to the island on September 16, 1921, but quite quickly they realized their rations were running low. Three of the crew members left Ada alone with the other member of the crew who was ill, while the three went off in search of resources, and this was the last time any of them were seen. Ada was left to care for this ailing member who was sure to treat her horribly while she essentially kept him alive. Soon the ill member passed away and Ada was now completely alone. Ada survived alone on this island for two years after they initially arrived. Two years! This is unbelievable for many reasons, including the imminent risk of a polar bear attack at any point. She ended up being rescued after all this time alone, and she used the little bit of money she had from selling furs that she collected over the two years to get the help needed to cure her son's tuberculosis. Ada was undoubtedly an incredible person with an unbelievable story, but it's also very important to note that not only did Ada receive criticism for not keeping that one crewmate alive, but she also spent the rest of her life in poverty, despite the multiple books that were written about her and the entire ordeal. I think that really speaks for itself. In our number one spot today, we have the Apollo 13 crew. Many of us have heard of this story before because it is truly unbelievable, but also because of the Tom Hanks classic. And no, I am not talking about Toy Story 2. This space crew took flight on April 11th, 1970, and had the intention of landing on the moon, but because of an oxygen tank explosion on board that nearly killed them all, these astronauts were forced to go the furthest out in space any living human has ever been in order to save their lives. They used the lunar module as a lifeboat, and they stretched their rations that were intended to be a day and a half worth of food for two people into food that lasted for four days among three people. They faced hardships some of us can't even imagine, while those on the ground worked tirelessly to figure out how to get them home safely. Had to make an orbital correction that took them far from the moon and about 248,655 miles from Earth before they could slingshot back around towards Earth. The lunar module was their safe space while still out in space, but re-entry to Earth is a totally different ballgame. This meant they had to get back into the damaged command module for this part before they were able to land back on Earth, and they did so safely. Everyone involved in this entire mission, from the crew in space to those on the ground working to save them, did incredible work, and it really is a story that will never be forgotten. Coming in at number 9, we have Natalia Pasternak. Natalia Pasternak came face to face with a brown bear who wanted her dead. She was walking through the forest in Siberia with a friend, and then all of a sudden her dog started to act up. There was clearly something very close. It was a brown bear. The bear quickly killed the dog and then beelined it straight for Natalia. Her friend tried to find off the bear, but the lady that Natalia was with was 80 years old, so she didn't really have the strength to take down a bear. Once this woman realized that she was no match for the bear, she took off to go get the police while Natalia was left behind being tossed around by this massive beast. The bear thought it had killed Natalia, and something that bears will do will bury something they've killed so they can come back to eat it later. Eventually, Natalia's friend and the police came back to find Natalia buried but still alive. She was taken to the hospital and survive. This lady is tough as nails. And guys, don't forget to hit that like button, it really helps us out. Coming in at number 8, we have Anna Williams. This young woman was nearly killed by the infamous BTK killer back in 1979. This is a horrific story. Dennis Rader, who is more famously known as the BTK killer, had picked Anna as his next victim. He knew her place inside and out and had been watching her for probably around 3 months. Late one night, he broke into her home, disabled her phones, and then he waited in the darkness for her to arrive. But she never did. Anna was out at a party, and she never came home that night. Eventually, the BTK killer left. Anna came home to find her house broken into, and then later got a letter from the deranged man that was a poem about the night that he broke into her home and stayed up late waiting for her to come back. That is Terrifying. Coming in at number 7, we have Anna Bagaholm. Anna Bagaholm was stuck in freezing water for so long they had to use a machine to heat up her blood to bring her back to life. Unless you're Wim Hof the Iceman. I don't feel the cold, I feel the power. Not all of us can withstand that kind of cold temperature, but Anna Bagaholm 
absolutely did. She was skiing in Norway and lost control and went to a river. Obviously getting wet while it's freezing outside is bad for your health, but you'll probably be able to get bundled up and return back to normal after a little bit of hot cocoa. Well, Anna was in a tough situation. She was actually wedged under the ice. Her friends had to come and rescue her and it took them 80 minutes to get her out of the water. In this time, her body temperature dropped from 99 degrees Fahrenheit to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Normally, if a person's core body temperature drops below 80, they will die. But Anna was strong enough to make it to the hospital. And as I said before, they used a machine to reheat her blood because at this point, her body was so cold, it was legally dead. Only 10% of people are able to survive this procedure and she was able to come out of this alive. Coming in at number six, we have Caleb Whitby. Caleb would get in one of the most horrific car accidents you can imagine and walk away without a mark on his body. He was driving home from work and collided with a semi that was in the same lane as him. This caused him to lose control of his car. The semi and him both swerved into the oncoming lane and then another semi coming in his direction smashed into them. The two semis sandwiched Caleb in his car and caused a huge multi-car pileup. Paramedics arrived on the scene along with the police and firefighters and after the dust had settled, they realized that trapped in his car like a little kid down a well was Caleb. He couldn't move. All he could do was yell for help. It took them six hours, but eventually they were able to cut him free from his car and pull him out. And once he was free, he might have been a little stiff from being cramped in there for so long, but he had zero injuries. That is insane. He was packed in a car tighter than a hot dog gets packed in Joey Chestnut's stomach. Coming in at number five, we have Melvin Roberts. How many times is too many times to get hit by lightning? Well, once should be enough, but how about 11 times? Melvin Roberts has been hit by a bolt from Zeus more times than I have won a crown at Fall Guys. This guy is literally a lightning rod. I mean, the list is supposed to be about lucky people who survive, but getting hit by lightning 11 times sounds like the worst luck of all time, but it is good luck that he's been able to survive all of this. He's been hit so many times, he knows how food tastes after you get hit by lightning. He talked about how getting hit by lightning makes everything have this sulfur taste because the lightning will cook your body from the inside side out. His insides must not be a very happy place. There's even a time where Melvin got hit by lightning when it was sunny out. That seems like it should be a crime against nature, but so far this dude keeps on ticking. He's 62 years old and might have a few lightning strikes left in him before he kicks the bucket. Coming at number four, we have a day in a volcano. Now this sounds like it would be a sweet little getaway for a lava monster, but this was a horror story from Michael Benson who had to live through this while he was shooting the movie Silver. Michael Benson and Chris Duddy were getting some aerial shots from a helicopter when things started to take a turn for the worse. The helicopter lost control and after a series of maneuvers, the two of them had to exit and were standing inside of a volcano in Hawaii. Chris was a little bit of a younger dude and more acrobatic and he was able to climb out of the volcano and then took off to go get help. Michael was stuck in there with a pool of lava bubbling below him, waiting for his body to fall in and get turned into a soup. On top of this, the intense heat was threatening to knock him unconscious and there was a ton of of fumes that were constantly billowing out of this bad boy. At any moment, he could have passed out. But right when things seemed that they were too far gone, after this dude had spent a day in a volcano, he was rescued. Coming in at number three, we have Ron Hunt. You think if a drill went through your eye and into your skull, it would be instant death. Well, Ron Hunt must have a brain made out of Teflon because he walked away from this one without any brain damage. I remember seeing this story on TV when I was a kid. It was back in 2003, and Ron Hunt was working as a construction construction worker. He was about six feet off the ground using a ladder. At one point, he started to feel the ladder wobble and it was pretty clear that he was about to head straight down towards the earth. He threw the drill but ended up landing right where the drill was going to land. The drill went into his head and through his eye and out the back of his head. He was extremely lucky because the drill bit moved his brain out of the way. After everything was said and done, Ron lost his eye but had zero brain damage. Coming in at number two, we have Emil Imagine being stuck in the middle of the Sahara Desert, your car just crapped out, and you barely have any supplies left. This is the sticky situation that Emile Loray got himself into. He was a French tourist who worked his way down to Morocco for one reason, and that was to take his little car and zip around off-roading in the sands of the Sahara Desert. Well, he did this, but his car broke down, and he was quickly burning through all of his supplies. He realized that if he was going to try and walk back, he would die, so he started to scrap his car for parts and made a makeshift motorcycle and rode it back to the city 
and survived. Coming in at number one, we have Friend Salak. Friend Salak has been killed nearly seven times and survived every single one of them, and then he won the lottery. This guy is probably the luckiest man who has ever lived. Yeah, well. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. But hear me out. The first time this guy almost died, he was 33 years old, and he was on a lovely train ride. The train derailed and crashed into a lake. A bunch of people were killed, 17 to be exact. But Fren is strong like bull, and he walked away without a scratch. And that wouldn't even be close to the end of his problems with transportation. While flying on a plane, the door would blast open, and Fren would get sucked out of the plane and fall to the earth. He would land on a haystack and live. The plane would crash, killing a handful of people that were on board. Later, he would be in a bus crash, a car crash, hit by a bus, and have the engine of his car blow up twice. And like I said before, this guy won the lottery and walked away with millions, and take this, he gave most of it away. This dude said life isn't about money. He kept enough to live comfortably with his wife, and gave the rest of the money to all of his friends. What a legend, dude. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ann Rogers. This story of 72-year-old Ann from Tucson, Arizona starts out on March 31st of 2016. After taking some wrong turns on a remote dirt road, Anne found herself a little lost, out of fuel, and out of range of cell phones. This led to her family of course reporting her missing. On the first night, Anne made a good decision by staying with her car. She had some extra clothes with her which helped keep her warm, she had some extra water, and some snacks for sustenance. The next day, however, Anne was feeling restless and like she needed to do something, so she left her car. Survival experts usually warn against that, and for a fair reason. If Anne had stayed with her car, she would have been found on April 3rd, which is when police found the abandoned car, but as we know, that didn't happen. Thankfully, however, Anne was still out there, and she was actually doing quite a good job at keeping herself alive. She built fires every night, she drank, quote, pond water to keep her hydrated, and she even found edible plants to consume, and at one point, a turtle, which she roasted and ate one night. Apparently, Anne had taken a class on survival, and she continued to research after the class, as she was particularly interested in desert survival. Talk about a coincidence, right? Apparently, at some point, in her journey, Anne became frustrated that authorities hadn't found her yet. She has since said, quote, I was frustrated, but I knew there were people who cared enough to make sure somebody found me. That is definitely true, Anne, but the authorities were also putting in a lot of effort. There were man trackers, scent dogs, and aircrafts all searching for her, and Anne was sure to use her skills to help them out. She made a large sign that read help from sticks and rocks, and this is what was spotted on the ninth day of her having been missing. The pilot who spotted her called for help and has said, quote, I was completely shocked. Up to that point, I thought we were looking for a body. I didn't expect to find her alive. The helicopter was able to swoop in and pick her up and Anne was treated at a local hospital and released a short while later. Anne was impressively prepared. She stayed calm and she did a lot of things that helped herself stay alive and be found, which is truly commendable. I think I might suddenly sign up for a survival course, you know, just in case. In our number nine spot today, we have the Donner Reed Party. If you were unfamiliar, the Donner Reed Party was a group of American pioneers who set out to head to California in 1846 in a wagon train. Apparently there was some Something that caused some delays for this trip, and instead of waiting for a better time, they set out, which only doomed them in the end. The group ended up becoming stuck for the winter of 1846 to 1847, and they were snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Some of the group couldn't withstand these harsh temperatures and unforgiving environment, and they ended up succumbing to either starvation or sickness, or perhaps a combination of the two. Those who were still alive had to resort to consuming those who had already passed away in order to stay alive. The group was snowed in high in the mountains, and the first of their help didn't arrive until February of 1847, almost four full months after they had become trapped in the first place. Two other rescue parties later came to them to bring them food and try to get at least some of the party out of the mountains. In the end, only 48 of the original 87 members ended up living to reach California. This sadly all could have been avoided in a multitude of ways, mostly by waiting until a more appropriate time to take this journey, but it is possible that they didn't know, and it's likely that no one expected this kind of tragedy to occur. In our Number 8 spot today we have the Gremlin Special. Okay, there are tribes of people that exist on this earth that we refer to as quote uncontacted. Basically there are communities or groups of indigenous people who live without sustained contact with other communities. Many of them want to be left alone to live their lives the way they choose, which is definitely something that should be respected. Some of these communities are hostile to visitors from the outside, which is pretty understandable, and some have ways of life that are extremely different from ours, which also makes a lot of sense. This is exactly why you can imagine Imagine everyone's surprise when a plane crashes right into the middle of an island that has a group of people who have a tradition where they consume the flesh of their enemies. On May 13, 
1945, a U.S. Air Force C-47 that had been nicknamed the Gremlin Special ended up crashing in New Guinea. Out of 24 people that it carried, only three of them survived the crash. Lieutenant John McCollum, who surprisingly was relatively unharmed, Women's Army Corps Corporal Margaret Hastings, and Sergeant Kenneth Decker, both of which were quite badly hurt. Well, as it turns out, sometimes rumors and rumblings are not at all what they turn out to be. While these three survivors were undoubtedly terrified to learn that they had crashed on an island full of cannibals, they soon realized that the stories they had heard were far from the actual truth. Oh. What a surprise! In the end, luckily for these three survivors, the group of people they came into contact with were exceptionally kind to them and helped nurse them back to health. In the end, they spent 42 days in the jungle, some of which were certainly more difficult than others, but in the end, they as well as their rescue crew were saved from the island and taken back home where they could continue to recover. In our number 7 spot today, we have The Fisherman. This story starts off when five men left a fishing village in Mexico on October 28, 2005, in the hopes to head out on a several day long fishing expedition. The first of many bumps in the road to occur was when they lost their heavy shark fishing tackle. Then, as they were trying to recover this lost tackle, their boat ran out of fuel. So far, not good. The shore winds pushed them further out to sea, and before they knew it, they were caught up in the current and being taken 5,000 miles deeper into the open ocean. While this was happening, the boat's owner, known as Juan David, as well as one of the fishermen on board, called El Farcero, passed away from starvation, and the other members buried them at sea. On August 9th, 2006, a Taiwanese fishing trawler spotted the boat and ended up rescuing the rest of the men. If you notice the date I started with and what date we're now at on their rescue, you'll realize that, yep, they last lasted 9 months and 9 days lost at sea. This is one of the longest on record in terms of sea survival, and the three survivors apparently did this by turning towards what they knew best. Fishing. This kept them fed on their journey along with the catching and eating of raw seabirds, which one of the members was apparently so good at catching, it earned him the nickname The Cat. They still had some knives and other small equipment with them and they used what they had to make hooks from engine parts and lines from cables. They learned to live off of this raw diet, they drank fish blood when there wasn't enough rainwater, and they passed the time by singing, dancing, pretending to play guitar, and praying. The worst of the times were in December and January when they were faced with harsh storms. They were unable to fish and there was a a serious and very real threat that their boat might sink. The longest the men went without food was 13 days when the three of them only had one seabird to share the entire time. In the end, as we know, they were rescued and taken back to their home where they were hailed as heroes. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Lykov family. In 1936, a Russian family of four was fleeing religious persecution and to do so they fled into the Siberian wilderness. They took with them a few possessions and some seeds and retreated into the forest. Here they would build a series of primitive huts as they traveled through until they finally reached a spot they found habitable, which was near the Mongolian border. They had no contact with the outside world and managed to become completely self-sufficient. When they originally fled into the wilderness, the family consisted of a husband and wife and their two children, and while out here in their new home, the couple had two more children, making them a family of six. They spent their days hunting, trapping, and farming, and each year they saved their seeds in order to replant when the next season came around. One of the possessions they brought with them was a crude spinning wheel which allowed them to turn hemp into fiber for their clothing. They ate a lot of potato pads that were mixed with hemp seeds and ground rye, and they lived like this for almost 50 years. They grew as much food as the land would allow, and they rationed carefully, but each year they grew closer and closer to starvation. As they grew closer to starving, they held a council meeting where they discussed whether or not they should save their seeds to replant or eat them all. Each year they ultimately decided to save their seeds, and one winter this cost the mother her life, which she sacrificed for her children. Until a geology team in 1978 found their home, the two youngest children had never even met a person outside of their family. While most of the family has since passed away, one member, the youngest daughter, as of 2019 still lives in this isolated location where she has built herself quite a decent hut and has a herd of goats and a coop of chickens. I'm not sure if this story is about devotion or if it shows how teamwork is essential or how people's faith can really keep them going or how survival instincts are the ultimate tool. Maybe it's just all of that wrapped up into one. In our number 5 spot today we have Madeline Connolly. Madeline was a Chicago woman who was out in Montana visiting an uncle of hers. While on this little trip, she set out with her dog for a nice little hike during the daytime, and while she wasn't familiar with the trail, it was marked so she felt like all should be well. Since it was a nice day when she left and she planned to be back before dark, she didn't bring a jacket with her or any food. By the time nightfall came and she wasn't home, she realized that she had gone far off the trail and wasn't even close to being home. Maddie said that she hiked quite late into the night, but ultimately decided to lay down, snuggle up with her dog so that they could both keep warm and get some rest before the next day. The following day, Maddie and her dog hiked the entire day, but still ended up 
up having to spend the night sleeping outside, as they were still lost and rescue didn't seem like it was coming. Maddie and her furry companion drank creek water and ate glacier lilies for seven days while they tried to stay alive and find a way out. After seven days of hiking, Maddie, on many occasions, felt like all hope was lost, but in an amazing and startling turn of events, Maddie and her pup ended up running into the party that was out searching for them. The pair were rescued and taken back home. They received the medical treatment they needed, and in the end, they made it out all right. In our number four spot today, we have Jan Balsrud. Jan was a young instrument maker during the era of World War II, and he was asked to help the anti Nazi resistance in Norway during the war. This led to him being on a boat that was traveling through the icy Norwegian waters, which is where the beginning of this story really takes place. While on board the ship, German soldiers began to shower the boat with bullets, which took the lives of everyone on board except for Jan. He managed to dive into the freezing waters with only one boot and sock on, and minus one big toe that had just been shot off. While being pursued by at least 50 of these German soldiers, he swam to the Norwegian coast where two girls who were on the beach helped him. There were several other Norwegian citizens who then came to secretly help him reach safety in Sweden, but it wasn't an easy route. At one point, he was traveling through the mountains while also trying to protect himself from an ambush style attack, and while doing so, he found himself caught up in an avalanche that caused him to fall 300 feet and left him snow blind and severely concussed. He then aimlessly wandered in the snow for days, suffering from hallucinations. He was then found by some kind person who helped nurse him back to health. Once healthy again, he then made another push to try and get to Sweden, but again was held back by German soldiers. He had to hide out in ice holes where he then had to cut off the rest of his toes to save his feet, and at one point he even attempted to take his own life because things were just so bad. In the end, this thankfully didn't work, and he was able to make it all the way safely to Sweden. This story definitely shows his bravery, his quick decision making and skills, but it also shows how everyone needs a little help along the way sometimes. In our number 3 spot today, we have Vesna Volovic. On January 26, 1972, Vesna was a 22 year old flight attendant, and she was signed to JAT Yugoslav Airlines Flight 3. 67 from Stockholm to Belgrade with a stopover in Copenhagen. Apparently, the company which she worked for had actually mistaken her for another employee who shared the same name, but since she had never been to Denmark before, she just saw it as an opportunity to travel and went on the flight anyway. Less than an hour on the journey from Copenhagen to Belgrade, the flight exploded midair. The plane fell from its height of 33,000 feet and landed in a village in what today is the Czech Republic. A member of the village, Bruno Honk, went to inspect the crash site, of course not expecting to find any survivors but he found one. Vesna. He pulled her from the wreckage and used his knowledge that he had as a World War II medic to keep her alive until rescue came. Among the 28 people on board the plane that day, Vesna was the only survivor. She suffered three broken vertebrae, two broken legs, broken ribs, and a fractured skull, and once she arrived in the hospital, she was in a coma for several days. When she awoke, she had no memory of the accident at all. Doctors didn't think she would ever be able to walk again, but after just 10 months, she was able to. Apparently, she credits this to her quote, Serbian stubbornness. Vesna's story is still one of the most incredible survival stories, and it landed her this strange Guinness World Record of longest fall without a parachute, which I don't think is a title she is too keen on holding. There are a number of reasons why people believe she escaped her certain death. Some believe her position in the rear of the airplane with the food cart prevented her from being sucked into the air when the plane broke apart. The plane's impact was also softened by the trees in the snow, but I think, hey, the woman survived a plane crash. Whatever the reasons or whatever led to that, it's all incredible and we should just focus on that. Vesna has been quoted as saying, quote, everyone thinks I am lucky, but they are mistaken. If I were lucky, I would never have had this accident. In our number two spot today, we have Tammy Ashcraft. If you've seen the movie Adrift, which stars Shailene Woodley, then you might be familiar with this story. In September of 1983, Tammy and her fiance Richard Sharp set out on a 4,000 mile journey across the Pacific Ocean in order to help a friend deliver a 44 foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. This was much longer than the pair had ever sailed before, but they felt due to their experience and having each other, they would be able to do it. So I mentioned they set sail in September, and by October, a Category 4 hurricane blew them way, way, way off course. The pair tried to ride out the storm that was kicking up 40 foot waves and 140 mile per hour winds, you know, hurricane stuff. And when Richard told Tammy to head below deck, right after, she heard him scream, and before she could help, she was thrown against a cabin wall and knocked unconscious. When she awoke the next day she found the yacht mostly destroyed and Richard was nowhere to be found. She found his safety harness dangling over the end of the boat
boat, which caused her to realize that he had been thrown overboard. The cabin was filling with water, the masts were broken, the sails were dragging in the sea, and both the navigational system and engine were in not very good condition. Despite her injuries and her loss, Tammy kicked into survival mode. She used a broken pole and a storm jib to create a makeshift sail, and she began pumping water out of the cabin. She found a sextant and a watch, which helped her navigate towards the closest landmass, which was the 1,500 mile away island of Hilo, Hawaii. In total, she spent 41 days adrift at sea and survived by eating canned fruit salads and sardines. In the end, she was saved by a Japanese research ship that had noticed the drifting yacht near the coast of the island. For six years after the accident, because of her head injury, she was unable to read, but when she was more recovered, she penned a book about the whole ordeal. Since she has spoken about the entire thing, saying, quote, definitely the hardest part was dealing with Richard being gone. There were times I didn't even want to live anymore because I didn't know how I was going to go on. I was never going to fall in love again. But she also added that, quote, but actually, while I was in the survival mode, the grief was fairly low. It wasn't as intense as when I got to shore and the survival was over, and I could see people together and everything kept reminding me of him. I just really had a hard time. But the survival instinct while at sea just kicked in. It helped me to focus, to keep myself on track. Tammy's story is definitely a reminder of just how strong our instincts can be. In our number one spot today, we have Beck Weathers. In the spring of 1996, American pathologist Beck Weathers headed out on an expedition to summit Mount Everest as a part of an eight-member crew that was led by veteran mountaineer Rob Hall. As the group got further and further up the mountain, Beck began to realize that due to an eye surgery he had previously had, he wasn't able to see very well in the harsh climate, and once it got dark out, his visibility was frighteningly low. Because of these vision troubles, when the group got near to the summit, Rob, the leader, told Beck to stay on the side of the trail while he took the rest of the group to the top, and he assured them that they would come back to get him on their way back down. Beck didn't really want to do this, but he agreed. He waited and waited and saw other groups pass him on their way down, and some others even offered to take him, but he stayed and waited for Rob. Unfortunately, Rob would never come back. Once the group had reached the summit, one of the climbers was too weak to continue on, and Rob refused to leave his side. One of the group members who did descend ended up passing Beck, which is how he got this information, and Beck decided to wait for another member of the team who was on their way down, Mike Groom, because he was Rob's fellow team leader. Once Beck was with Mike and the other climbers, they began making their way down, but of course, there was a blizzard brewing. The storm left Beck and the other climbers quite disoriented, and they couldn't find Camp 4, which was the camp that was closest to the summit. When the storm broke, Beck and four other climbers were so weak that they were left alone so that those who were stronger could go off in search of help. Another guide from another group came to rescue several of the climbers, but at this point, Beck wasn't there anymore. This is because he had previously lost one of his gloves and he began to really feel the effects of the high altitudes and absolutely freezing temperatures, which led to a sort of delirium. He apparently jumped to his feet, yelled out, I've got this all figured out, and then was subsequently thrown from his feet, toppling over the other climbers climbers by gale force winds. The other climbers were sure he had died, but he didn't. Instead, he was spending the night in a bivouac in a blizzard with his hands and face exposed to the elements. When he woke up, he figured that he had been left for dead, and he started to think, if I don't get up right now, then this is all going to be over very quickly. His sheer willpower managed to get him up, and he hiked all the way back down to Camp 4 on his own. His fellow climbers were shocked to see him, and they still didn't believe he was going to live, so they thought they might as well just make him comfortable. In a tent alone, Beck made it through another freezing night in utter agony thanks to his frozen and hands and face, and the next day the other climbers were again shocked to see him still alive and coherent. Finally, they helped him walk on his frozen feet down to a camp lower down, where one of the highest altitude medical evacuations performed by a helicopter was done. In the end, four of the people on Beck's original group passed away, but Beck escaped with his life. Following the rescue, he had his right arm amputated halfway between the elbow and wrist, all four fingers and his thumb on his left hand were amputated, as well as parts of both of his feet. His nose was amputated and reconstructed with tissue from his ear and forehead. Following the entire ordeal, Beck has said that the experience was worth it because he gave him a renewed sense of purpose. He said, quote, I gave up some body parts, but I got back my marriage. I got back my relationship with my kids. I've got a new grandbaby. All in all, if I had to do it again, every pain, every misery, every bit of suffering that comes from it, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Kick off your list at number 10, first class passengers. While traveling in first class, it might feel more comfortable at first, but when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. You would think, obviously, but here's why. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. That's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people passed away, but in hindsight, 
a lot of people made it. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats. And then afterwards, it was first class men. See, by that point, there were few lifeboats left, which I'll get into, of course, later on. But second class and third class, their chances at survival here, right off the bat, were not great, simply because they were divided by class. Being stored further and lower from these lifeboats, the odds weren't in their favor. There were more than 700 third class passengers, and that number exceeded the other two classes combined. It's horrible. Those rooms were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room, and the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly, these passengers had the hardest time getting out, which we don't often think of when we think of, you know, the Titanic and the sinking of it. Number nine, the band. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know that music can heal a lot of people, of course. While I'm absolutely sure there is nothing that could have been done to completely erase people's worries about what was about to happen on the Titanic that fateful night, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music, and I'm sure that it helped somebody in some way, shape, or form. It wasn't just in the movie, right? The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up. First, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them too, but it turns out this is far from the truth. See, the band members were in fact not ship employees at the time, which means they technically had the same rights as any other passenger to leave and board a ship, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship, and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. The film can't quite capture the beauty. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad their acts have been remembered, even still. Number eight, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic that fateful night, and Tanky Magazine actually published her survival story afterwards, titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Yeah, I mentioned the first class differences between third class, so this story here is already a feat in itself. Ellen and her husband, Pecco, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound, and the engines then started to act up. Pecco ran out to see what was going on, the hallway was tilted by the time Ellen poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. Then there was a knock at the door. One of her friends from Finland came in, and they said the ship was sinking, but Peko was nowhere to be seen, and her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway? All the doors are locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next. After a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to third deck, where they were then taken to the Carpathia, and they didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the following day. So after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Ilan only received $125. That's all the ship could give them. They're like, we're sorry you lost everything. Here's the best we can do. That's it. Number seven, no binoculars. On that fateful night of the collision with the iceberg, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Now, of course, this could have changed literal history had they have been used, but why weren't they? The key to said lockup, storing the binoculars, was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Now, of course, this may not have made a difference at all, but it's important to note. To think that these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest the entire time is haunting now when you consider the history of it. The poor guy was trained transferred to another ship and forgot a key. The amount of times I've forgotten a key or taken a work key home by accident, I mean, it's a simple mistake, but in this case, tragedy, really. Number six, ignored flares. Just 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, and the crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about icebergs. The Titanic had received six warnings about icebergs before the collision. Now, while the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all six were. Why so? The captain of this other boat, he slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought that they were company rockets. The SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. Yep, he took a little power nap after ignoring all the flares. By the time they had heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was obviously too late, sadly. Number five, less lifeboats. Before the Titanic even set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. Why they did this? Beats me, I don't know. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we're talking about the safety of, I don't know, 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were, you know, collapsible. 
So 24-ish lifeboats, 2,208 passengers. Doesn't add up, that's not, uh, it's a terrible ratio. Which means they should have had time to launch every single one, but this would still be only enough for half the passengers on board. It was cursed from the get-go. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly, and it was chaos. There are quite a few lessons that can be definitely learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that safety precautions taken for these ships simply were just not up to par. It wasn't really about the iceberg. I mean, that did it, but there were other things that could have helped. Number four, the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marianne Meanwell. This must seem like any ordinary find after a wreck, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was then revealed that Marianne was not intended to be on the Titanic at all, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows us that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but for some reason, the trip she'd originally planned was delayed, and she instead was a signed to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see the word majestic was actually crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. It's, it's so haunting to look at now. There's no way anybody could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation to look back on. And to physically see the cancellation of the ship gives me goosebumps. That's really horrible. Number three, Eliza Melvina Dean. This story really is something. Okay, buckle up. When thinking back to this tragedy, it's hard to imagine how it looked in real time, like being on the ship, right? I mean, you know, not from James Cameron's perspective, right? It was a moonless night in the pitch black. Of course the navigation was hard, of course it could have been handled better, or they could have listened to the numerous warnings, but again, it was pitch black. This is what the iceberg looked like in real life. Eliza Dean was only a newborn on the Titanic. Her parents were on the way to the States with everything that they owned packed up in their luggage. See, Eliza's father was actually on the deck at the time of the collision, so he saw the ship hit that iceberg. How terrifying is that? But in doing so, he knew in that moment, get the family, hit the deck, something bad's gonna happen. Even as third-class passengers, they were thankfully some of the first on the lifeboats, which is incredible seeing as what I said earlier. It was Eliza, her brother, and her mother. They all got aboard safely, but her father Father, of course, never made it off, which is terrible, but his quick thinking saved his family. Number two, John Jacob Astor. As the ship was sinking, the first class passenger, John Jacob Astor, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he immediately saw two terrified children standing behind him. And it happened. He instead gave up his spot and let those other two children on the boat, which is just noble, it's brave, it's heroic. I, it's something that you ask yourself, could I do that? If it actually were to happen, would I have the willpower to do that? I hope so, this is absolute bravery. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments later on after this brave moment. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. It's tragic. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news here is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety, and they survived the entire ordeal. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also don't hear enough about the bravery that people showed during this tragic event. And finally, number one, Molly Brown. In total, there were 706 people who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Molly Brown has been referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown. And when you look into her story, it really checks out. Margaret Brown not only survived the Titanic, which is just an incredible feat in itself, and it's the odds there are just incredible, but once aboard the life ship, she threatened the quartermaster. She said she'll throw him overboard if he didn't go back immediately and start looking for more survivors. That's bad. That, that is something I will do. I hope I can do in a moment like this. That's incredible. Historically, this is where the accounts get a little hazy. See, it's not confirmed whether the boat actually went back to look, but after narrowingly surviving a tragedy, then you're barely conscious. You still think of other people? That's the, that's the moral of the story here. Margaret was traveling in Egypt, but when a grandchild got sick, she ended her trip early just to go back to the States and take care of them. Once she got all this attention after surviving said disaster, she then campaigned publicly for women's rights and education for the poor. She was a badass in the boat and then a badass afterwards. Like, this is insane. There was a musical comedy in the 60s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown, so her name will be remembered for a while as it should be. Thank you, Molly. So starting off this list, in at number 10, we have these three people who survived a small plane crash in Wisconsin. Three people, including an infant, survived after the small plane crashed into a parked car near the runway. The single engine plane lost its altitude, but it is still not clear whether the plane struck something before it crashed into the car. Amazingly, the parents of the infant were the other survivors. And all of them were not seriously injured, and they were all conscious when emergency responders arrived on the scene. Number nine, 
brings us to an airline co-pilot. Jim Polanke was at the controls in 2006 when his aircraft crashed during takeoff from Kentucky, killing all 49 people on board. As a result of the incident, he lost his left leg, but he was able to survive from the wreckage. He spent years fighting accusations by investigators that he and the pilot were to blame. Apparently, the flight crew failed to cross-check and verify that the airplane was on the correct runway before takeoff. This is extremely scary, especially because the disaster could have been avoided. Moving right along, in number eight, we're talking about Carolyn Cross, the mother of Three boarded a Northern Thunderbird air flight headed to BC on October 27, 2011. About 15 minutes after the plane took off, the pilot announced that he had to turn back to Vancouver's airport because of a small oil leak. Now that sounds very serious, and it was. The plane was out of control, and everyone on board started to panic. Carolyn grabbed her cell phone and began to type goodbye messages to her children and husband. Really sad moment. She was able to send this message just minutes before the plane crashed onto the ground. She woke up to the smell of fuel and she was shortly rescued by a bystander. She was rushed to the hospital where she was treated for a jaw trauma, broken ribs and fractured pelvis. She had broken teeth and also a knee injury. There were only nine passengers on the plane but the smaller the plane the deadlier. Luckily all the passengers survived except for the pilot and co-pilot who unfortunately didn't make it. George Lampson Jr. makes his appearance on this list at number seven. He was a sole survivor of an airline crash back in 1985 that killed his father and 69 others in Reno, Nevada. Moments before the takeoff, George and his father switched seats and to this day he wonders if that's what saved his life and cost his father his life. Could you imagine? I couldn't imagine being in that moment and you're like thinking like this. According to reports, the crash was caused by the failure of the captain and co-pilot to control the monitor of the plane's path and airspeed. Number six, we have a Brazilian soccer player who survived the plane crash because he switched his seats earlier on the flight. I mean, that gives me some chills. Like, if he didn't switch seats, he wouldn't have survived. And for the last one, the person who switched seats with his father. Alan Rushall recently opened up about surviving the tragic plane crash that killed 19 of his teammates. This was pretty recent if you guys can remember it. He told reporters that he was originally seated near the back of the plane but he moved forward when the team's goalkeeper asked him to move up and sit next to him. He might have saved his life. Alan and the goalkeeper were among the six people who survived the horrific crash that killed 71 people in total. He had to undergo spinal surgery after the crash but because of where he was sitting on the plane he was able to survive it. And now at number five we have a sole survivor of a plane crash who spent eight days in a jungle. And we're talking about Annette Herfkins, who was the sole survivor of a horrifying 1992 plane crash that occurred in Vietnam. Her boyfriend of 13 years died in the incident along with 22 other passengers and six crew members. She survived eight days with multiple injuries and sustained herself only on rainwater. Some passengers survived the initial impact but died before they can get rescued because it was days later. Now Annette is working as an author and a motivational speaker. Up next, at number four, we have this miraculous 13 year old. After her plane crashed in the Indian Ocean back in 2009, Bahia Bakari held only a piece of plane wreckage for more than nine hours without wearing a life vest. Among those who died were her mother and 151 other people. The news media were calling her Miracle Girl, which I think is pretty appropriate for this situation. According to reports, the incident was caused by an inappropriate actions of the crew on the flight controls after the plane stalled. Up next, at number three, we're talking about the Miracle Child. Cecilia C. Shin was just four years old at the time when she was the only survivor on a Northwest Airlines flight. Amongst the wreckage was 154 bodies, only this four year old managed to survive. This fatal crash claimed the lives of her parents and six year old brother. She suffered from horrific injuries including a fractured skull, broken legs and collarbones as well as third degree burns. The flight took off from Detroit runway and just 50 feet above the ground the plane started to roll from side to side. The engine stalled and the plane hit a lighting pole which sliced 18 feet off of its left wing, this crash remains as one of the deadliest air disasters in US history. In our number 4 spot today we have The Strangers. This story comes from Tyler Black 729 on Reddit, but it is actually a story from their father and his experience while having open heart surgery when he was in his 20s. The doctors had to stop his heart for around 20 to 30 minutes during the procedure so that they could put a mechanical valve in. Before this surgery, he explained that he wasn't on a great path in life and had been involved in some things he definitely shouldn't have been. So while his heart was stopped on the operating table, he found himself in a very dark place and he began wandering and searching around. This is when he started running into 
really scary people that looked very strange and they were all screaming at him. He was running away as fast as he could and found a corner to hide in. The people were continually getting closer though and right before they got him he saw his grandmother who had previously passed away and she reached down to grab him. The next thing he remembered was being back in the hospital. He is convinced that he was in a temporary hell and this scare was enough for him to completely turn his life around. Number three, Danian Brinkley again. Yeah, like I said, he survived multiple near death experiences so we had to throw in one more. I know you're curious, right? Of course. In 1989, during an open heart surgery, Brinkley was again declared dead. He was sure this time that he had visited the afterlife, so he wrote a book about it this time. This book was called Saved by the Light. When questioned about his time seeing the other side and if heaven and hell were a real thing, he had an interesting response. He said, if I didn't go to hell in the last four journeys, nobody's going to hell, okay? When you learn you don't die, when you learn that you're a spiritual being, you're not going to hell. That's enough to inspire you to change. I don't know. It's almost like a parent being like, hey, we're not going to ground you, just, you know, be good. It's like, mm, okay. In our number two spot today, we have Peter's NDE story. A Polish man named Peter once tried to take his own life, and that is how his experience on the other side happened. He explained that his first visions were of people right beside him, but they were people in his life who had already passed away. He said that they were all friendly to him, but that they were also terrifyingly sad. After this, he explained that he felt like he was being dragged into a dark abyss that was supposed to be the afterlife, and in seeing the dark distance, he realized how frightening the situation was. He then explains that he was brought back to life by by a commanding voice. I'm not sure what this commanding voice was, but I'm glad he heard it and listened. Peter's story has also been featured in a book titled The Polish Life After Life. And finally, number one, Hannah's pneumonia. This last one of the day comes from a Czech woman named Hannah who experienced complications from pneumonia, which led her to her near-death experience. While others on this list have somewhat calming recollections of the afterlife, how they felt and all that jazz and how hell may not even be a thing, which is, I gotta say, phew. This one here is more of what Hannah saw. It left me feeling off. Hannah saw a gray area that had lots of scattered boards and beams of light and stuff. And then she explains that in the top right, there was a circular light with an extremely bright center that she said felt really inviting and that it was pulling her in almost. This was like the center thing, I don't know. This could be the light that Damien saw and titled his book after, who knows. It was at this point she realized what was happening and the light was leading her into the official other side. And suddenly I realized with horror that it was a transition between life and death, she says. I do not want to enter. I have not tried everything in my life. And she was brought back swiftly after that moment. Maybe the trick is to tell whatever or whoever that you're not ready. It's pretty wild also to do, so who knows. Thanks for sharing, Hannah. We're glad everything's okay. Kicking off the list at number 10, when I lived in Ireland. Jim Tucker and Jennifer Kim Penberthy are psychiatry professors at the University of Virginia. They think about death a lot pretty much. Tucker specializes in near-death experiences with young adults who claim to have memories of a past life. Yeah, that's a job, apparently, coming out of school. I didn't learn about any of that. This is a theme on this channel. We've heard about these cases in part one and two, and they believe there's more than living in this body and then simply dying. For example, Reddit user Aproballs hit the World Wide Web to share their experience and how they remembered a past life when they were young. Between the ages of three and five, I talked about when I lived in Ireland, and I was able to tell my parents the names of the places that I remembered. My mom said she was in absolute shock because I was so casual about it, more than fair. Also, this was in the early 80s in South America. There was no internet or anything like that. We're not Irish, and no one in my family has ever been to Ireland or has any interest in it. Subtle, subtle roast with that one. One day, I just stopped talking about it, just like that. I don't remember anything about this supposed past life, and I don't remember talking about Ireland as a child either. Well, thanks for sharing. Uh, honestly, to be fair, some places in Ireland sound made up, as is. You know? Like this place. I can't even say that name. That's why we pulled up a picture. Mucken Ganeer de Halia. Awesome. Put that in Google Maps, I dare you. I probably said this word after a bar night myself, but that's a wild story nonetheless. The no internet thing really sold me on this story. I hope you had a wonderful St. Patrick's Day in your past and current life this past week. Thanks for sharing. In our number nine spot today, we have The Flames. This afterlife story comes from someone named Don Brubaker, and during their experience, they know for a fact that they were in hell. They explained that there was a sort of low murmuring that could be heard around them, like they were among a bunch of people that were sort of grumbling. Suddenly, there was a huge black door right in front of them, and they could kind of feel the air begin to change, like there was a glow and shimmer that showed the heat that was coming from whatever lay beyond the door. As the door opened, they saw this huge room that they described as an oven, just completely filled with flames. 
Normally upon seeing this you'd be compelled to run in the opposite direction, but instead Don explained that they felt drawn like a magnet right into the center of the flames despite their feeling of complete fear. There were hundreds of people already in the flames just roasting to death, but not dead. Don ends the story by just saying that once they were inside, the door slammed shut behind them. Like Don, what happened next? How'd we get back here? Apparently Don writes for Netflix because that was the cliffhanger of the century. Number eight, Stairway to Heaven. This next one comes from Dr. Pirate 42. Great name, right off the bat. I don't believe in the paranormal. I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I have degrees in science and healthcare and I'm pretty grounded. Hot start, right off the bat. But since I was a child, I had this memory of me stumbling out of the back door of some club. I couldn't hold myself either. Maybe I was really intoxicated, whatever the case. And I slipped down a staircase, hit my head in the alley, and died. I was about 19. I was thin, had long blonde hair. I was wearing a brown, red leather jacket. I remembered the neon signs, the staircase, the door I walked out of, even the interior. I could paint the picture perfectly if I had any talent in art. Anyways, two years ago, I took a leisure trip to Budapest, and while exploring the Runes pub with my wife, I found the alley. That same one that I remembered. It was funny because I remarked to my wife earlier when we arrived that I felt something about Budapest that, you know, felt like home and felt familiar in a way. And I felt oddly too comfortable to be there, like I could have never left. I think about this quite often. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Dr. Pirate 42. Awesome, again, name, great name again. Pretty brave of you to be excited in this situation. To be honest, if I found the place that I died in a previous life, I would freak out. I wouldn't be calm, cool, or collect. I would walk down those stairs so slowly and be like, don't do it again, don't do it again. But alas, you're alive and well this time around. Love it. Drink responsibly also, please, maybe, thanks. Number two, the big empty. This story comes from Reddit user Sin Jessica. It's about a near-death experience they had after attempting to take their own life. After they felt time slow down, they came to a place that they referred to as the big empty. And the way they described it, it was just literally just plain nothingness. They say they don't really know how to describe it, but honestly, I think they did a pretty bang job. They call it a void and say there's no darkness, there's no you, there's no nothing, that makes sense. It's such a complete lack of anything at all that it can't even be described as empty because that would imply it could be filled with something to begin with. Know what I mean? Some deep stuff like that. It's hard to even realize that this exists because you can't even really perceive it in your mind. Now luckily this person had a nosy neighbor who saw what was unfolding at this time and reacted quickly and saved their life. And since that day things have been a lot better for Sin Justica, which is just the best news. But at the same time, the Reddit user reminds us that the big empty still haunts them. More than fair. It's called The Big Empty. I mean, that would stick in my brain too. In our number one spot today, we have The Sister Visit. This story comes from someone who is a nurse at an assisted living facility. Imagine that job. That would be a super difficult job to have. I definitely couldn't do it. This story, however, is kind of unbelievable. They write, quote, Yesterday, a resident on another unit, but same floor as mine, went unresponsive at 7.30. Sternal rub given with no response, eyes closed, no response to anyone or anything. Doctor and family called in. Family did not want him sent to a hospital, so they began palliative care, expecting death that same morning. Two hours later, with family in the room, he opens his eyes. His wife says, where have you been? He says, I went to heaven. It's so beautiful there. My sisters were there, and they were healthy and gorgeous. I was asked if I wanted to come back, and I said, for a while. He had two sisters that died years ago. Today, he ate his breakfast in the dining room, and we are all in awe of his story. It's the best possible outcome. The ideal ending, really, what more could you ask for? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Fields of Gold. This story comes from a Reddit thread in which the original poster asked the question of what those who had died and been resuscitated remembered seeing. A Reddit user replied to the thread and explained a story that their mom had told them about when her heart stopped during surgery. Their mom thankfully was brought back and when she recovered enough and woke up from surgery, she later explained that all she remembered was being in a field of flowers. So here I am, hearing that, thinking of Wizard of Oz, everyone's just skipping down the yellow brick road, but turns out, maybe it's nothing like that. There was one Redditor who commented on this story with a hot take that kind of made me feel a little uneasy about the whole thing. They explained how it makes sense that the field of flowers is traditionally a more calming image, but that it feels odd to them. A little unnerving and empty, totally devoid of other people. I'm not gonna lie, that does sound quite eerie, but I'm sure for some of you watching this video, that truly does sound like heaven. Number nine, flipped over. This next one comes from a user named Harry and Lana. One semester, they had a class where a man came in to explain his near-death experience, which is, I gotta say, it's a pretty exciting class. That's a fun drop-in spot, I guess. The man was kayaking with a friend and he ended up flipping his kayak over, worst scenario ever, and then he got sucked under by the current. His friend had to watch him pass out underwater 
then get dragged down the river, which is just a nightmare scene. And during his time unconscious, the man describes this dark place, almost as if it was a cave. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that he was in a kayak. Maybe it was just coincidence. I don't know. But the walls were soft and almost velvet-like, if that makes sense. And at the end of this cave, there was a plethora of colors. And he described it as a kaleidoscope almost, which is kind of beautiful and almost sickening. I would probably throw up looking at that. It was a stained glass window that was moving, essentially. It was Doctor Strange type stuff. But he saw dark figures passing by on the other side of this glass, which is the concerning part. Who's there? I saw Insidious. Maybe it's like that kind of demonic stuff. That dude on the other side of the glass who's like wheeling something. Maybe it's something like that. Or maybe it's something nice. I don't know. Either way, I want nothing to do with that. He also said you must have to be pretty terrible to go to hell because he himself wasn't the greatest of guys before this. Mm, so, you know, know what I mean? His friend caught up to his body, he was luckily revived, but now the man feels a stronger connection with everybody, and he's grateful to have had this experience, which is nice, I guess, in this sense. The user finishes the story by saying they hope this was calming to hear, as the rest of these are pretty horrifying. I'm not gonna lie, it gets scarier as we go on. In our number eight spot today, we have 45 years. In 1943, Dr. George Ritchie died of pneumonia, but after nine long minutes, he came back and was sure to tell the tale of what happened while he was gone. He went on to write a book called Return from Tomorrow, and my life after dying. He recounts a lot of stuff in this book from an out-of-body experience to meeting people, but the last thing he remembered was meeting someone who he calls God. Whoever this person or being was that he met left him a mental message that told him, quote, it is left to humanity which direction they shall choose. I came to this planet to show you through the life I led how to love. Without our father you can do nothing, neither could I. I showed you this. You have 45 years. When he came back to his body he explained that his throat was on fire and that he felt weight on his chest that was crushing him. I'm not exactly sure what this message was supposed to mean. I mean mostly the whole 45 years thing. Dr. Ritchie passed away in 2007, which was almost 64 years after his near-death experience. But whatever this message was intended to mean, that was probably the coolest and most terrifying thing in the world. Number seven, love is in the air. It's 1983. Dave Bennett, chief engineer of an underwater research vessel, aka my worst nightmare of a job. One night he was in the ocean and he didn't mean to be. He was thrown in from the vessel and and he drowned. What he felt afterwards was wild. He felt like there was some omnipresence keeping him from being alone, which is comforting, but also terrifying on paper. He felt some sort of comfort and recalls the darkness slowly coming to life. As darkness was slowly fading into light, he began to move towards it. Dave himself reflects on this saying, as I got closer, there were waves and waves of love that were just wrapping me in this warm embrace. It was the most amazing feeling I ever had, and it felt as if this love was actually permeating my being, and it transformed me into this being of life. That's a lot of knowledge. Some, you're now woke. As I got closer to the light, the light appeared to me like it was millions upon millions of fragments of light." End quote. That's jam-packed, okay. He even recalls seeing his family, not like his family that he knew, or even ancestors for that matter, but his soul family. Apparently that's a thing. His soul family told him to go back to the land of living and fulfill his purpose. And after 18 minutes later, he popped back to the surface just just full of knowledge and wisdom, it seems. In our number six spot today, we have The Void. I'm not exactly sure what caused this woman's close encounter with death, but she is another person who experienced the black void that a lot of other people have as well. She explains that she was drawn in by the dark void after her death. She said she did not feel her body, which made her totally terrified. She said this is when she just experienced nothingness and said it was like a dreamlike experience. She said she felt drawn in by this void and said it felt like she was heading towards another realm of existence. I'm not exactly sure what that would feel like, but I think I am very grateful that I don't. In the end, she was of course able to be resuscitated and brought back, which I am very glad about. Number five, Panorama View. This one comes from a man named Danian Brinkley. He's a US Marine, businessman, and God, apparently. He survived numerous near-death experiences. One time in 1975, a bolt of lightning had hit a telephone pole, traveled all the way down the line into his body, and then he was dead for 28 minutes straight. This guy woke up in a morgue, which I gotta say, people move fast, 28 minutes, that's, they really, no time wasted. Brinkley recalls floating above his body the entire time. He was watching from above as doctors declared him dead, which I can't even imagine what that feels like. But he recalls the feeling. He saw his entire life passing in front of him like a 360 degree panorama. He had missed nothing at all. You know how many hairs were in the nose of the doctor who pulled you from your mother? You know everything that there is from the time you open your eyes. You have complete cognitive awareness, no doubt about it. And that's all happening at the same time, no doubt about it. And then you watch the same life from a second person's point of view as if you were your 
your own best friend. So you can see how silly, how funny, and how dumb, and how stupid life was, but it's through one of your best friend's point of view, you know? There's no judgments, just looking. And then you literally become every person you've ever encountered, and you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and that person. So no one gets away with anyone or anything. Well, thank you for your service, Danian. Also, that was the wildest thing I've ever heard in my life. We'll talk about him more. He's obviously gonna appear back up in this list. In our number seven spot today, we have shadows, sunflowers, and streams. This story was posted on Reddit by a user called Through the Shadows, and their story is in reference to a time when their wife was in a coma, and it was looking like she wasn't going to make it. You know, it's at the point where the hard conversations are being had. Surprisingly, there's a shocking and complete turnaround, and she ended up making a completely miraculous recovery. Truly the best outcome of what was likely a horrifying situation, and while the storyteller's wife doesn't remember much from her time in the coma, she remembers two very vivid things that she calls dreams. In the first dream, she was having a fun party and everything was great, except for one guy who she calls Sleazy, and she said gave her the creeps. He was charming and invited her to go with him, but she refused and said that she knew that he was a bad guy. This guy then told her that he was going to take her soul and torment it until he destroyed it, which of course led to her running away from him, and then that was the end of that dream. In the second dream, she woke up alone in a field of sunflowers. There was a stream of water that separated the field from this beautiful forest, and when she went towards the stream, she noticed that there were leaves with people's names on them that she loved, like family names, pet names, and then they were floating down the stream. At this point, she knew she couldn't quite cross the stream, so she walked back into the field. Number six, regret. This story comes from a Redditor who had their afterlife experience after attempting to take their own life. They were thankfully saved in the ambulance, they gained consciousness for about five seconds, and then they collapsed into a coma right afterwards. After being in a coma for a few weeks, they wrote about their experience on the other side. They said, all I remember is a feeling similar to general anesthesia, but before I went black, I was in total panic, and I had a total change of heart in my decision to end it seconds before. And then it was just nothing. Like a deep sleep almost. And when I finally awoke from the coma, it was like finally reaching the surface of a pool after diving too deep. I was in the same panic that I was immediately after I jumped from my table. Like I just blinked instead of being knocked out for two weeks. I don't remember anything at all. It was like being in a deep dreamless sleep. Perhaps if I regained consciousness immediately after, I'd remember something more interesting, but nothing is about all I can offer. Honestly, I'll, I'll take that. I'm glad nothing is the case here than demons or anything else that we've seen on this list. And also, we're glad you're alright. Stay strong. In our number five spot today, we have the hair cut catastrophe. This story starts out with the OP explaining that their afterlife experience came after they had suffered a seizure. It's a good time to remind everyone that not all seizures look the same, like how this person just put their head down and simply stopped breathing. How absolutely terrifying that would be. They were getting their hair done at the time and while they sat there and their lips were turning blue, they could hear what was going on around them as the poor stylist was yelling into their phone for the ambulance to get there. They then go on to write, quote, I was aware of being very warm and comfortable. I knew I was not breathing, but there was no anxiety or discomfort with it. Everything was very relaxed. There is a sense of otherness. I would call it God, no gender, but all other names in different religions applied just as well. I knew then, just as I can tell you my name now, that there is no one right religion or spirituality. Just like you can climb a mountain using more than one trail, so is our non-physical life. When you die, you can choose to stay forever as a separate being, reincarnate into another life, stay for for a while, then reincarnate, or simply become part of the otherness and lose yourself in it. I was told it was not my time, that each of us has a set time to live on Earth. When your time is up, it is up. I was not given an explanation beyond that. I got sent back and started breathing on my own before the ambulance guys could do much with me. Honestly, this might be the wrong time to ask, but I'm just wondering if the stylist finished the haircut after. Number four, the wake up. This one's a little different from the others on this list. It comes from the Reddit user Brofist Panda. Also, great name. When they experienced death, they said it wasn't really like anything at all. In fact, it was just like sleeping. They do, however, remember being resuscitated. They said it was like shock all of a sudden and then boom, you take the most painful gasp of air and your eyes are burning from the lights around you and you see all these people in masks standing around you have to now restrain you so that you don't jump up and rip out your IV. Which, yeah, more than fair. I couldn't imagine waking up to any of that visually, let alone feeling it at the same time. That's That's gotta be a lot. I'm glad you ended up making it. You are a trooper. Hashtag Brofist Panda. I'm gonna steal that name. In our number three spot today, we have 45 minutes. Brian Miller is a man who is from Ohio and he had a death experience after he suffered a terrible massive heart attack. That wasn't the end though as to the surprise of the nurse 
nurses and doctors around him, after 45 minutes, his heart began to beat again. The 41 year old has now gone on to speak about what he saw in the time that he was gone. He said he saw light and that he saw relatives who had already passed away. He explains that he was walking on a path that was lined with flowers when he was stopped by his mother in law, who had passed away quite recently. He said, quote, She grabbed a hold of my arm and she told me that it's not your time. While this story is certainly intriguing, what's even more fascinating is how, for the 45 minutes he was gone, his brain did not receive any oxygen, and yet, upon his return, he miraculously did not suffer any brain damage. I have so many questions as to how that's possible. I guess it really was just not his time yet. In our number 7 spot today, we have The Tunnel. This afterlife story comes from someone who goes by the online username Free Hat McClough, and they said, quote, It felt like I was in a long tunnel, just floating and feeling very tired. I remember falling asleep and having a dream that I was in the kitchen in the house where I grew up and my dad was cooking breakfast. I could hear a commotion and chaos at one end of the tunnel, and at the other, there was a warm light that felt peaceful. Then, all of a sudden, I was abruptly in the chaos of an emergency room. That would really be quite the feeling. You'd be so grateful that you woke up, but also going from that kind of peace to the utter chaos and calamity of an emergency room would be jarring and probably a little frightening to say the least. Number six, floating. My mother and I were in a very bad car crash. She went into cardiac arrest and was resuscitated with the paddles. She told me that she was then floating above her own body and then abruptly ended up in a tunnel. Suddenly she heard my deceased uncle tell her that she had to go back and that it wasn't her time yet. She said that after he said so, the tunnel then closed and she ended up back in her body. Those are the words of the woman's daughter, Gina. Well, I'm glad you're both okay. That's probably pretty horrifying. This is another theme that comes up often, seeing a deceased loved one afterwards. Like her uncle saying it wasn't her time yet. That's so common. It's creepy. The common argument here, in this case, from a scientific point of view, is that it's our brain fooling us. It's releasing chemicals that make us hallucinate. Your body releases these chemicals when you're born or when you die, but the argument Tucker is trying to make here with their studies is that hallucinations are the result of your sensory cortex going haywire. But when you're dying, that part of the brain, it can't function. It's not a hallucination or a trip, yet this experience still changes people. Drive safe. Thanks for sharing, Gina. In our number five spot today, we have The Shapes. This afterlife experience starts out with someone explaining that this is a story that happened to their dad who had open heart surgery. They said that during their operation, he briefly died on the table before having his heart restarted. During this time on the other side, they explained that he went to hell. They go on to write, quote, It apparently consisted of lots of geometric shapes and mirrors. It was one of those things where he just kind of knew. It hit him and there was no doubt that's what it was. He said it was the worst thing he could imagine. He was laying on a hospital bed with the worst pain, not able to move, locked in this geometric eternity. Listen, I truly believe that for some people, hell definitely could just be a ton of geometric shapes and mirrors, but if that is the case, then where did Hot Flames Oven Guy go to? I'm just saying. I personally take geometric shapes over hot oven roasting, but I definitely can't speak for everyone here. Number four, hay is for horses. This one comes from username Miriam67. They say, I don't have kids, but when my brother was a toddler, he said something to my mom about throwing hay in the window for the horses. My grandfather died before his birth and was a farmer, and the barn had windows and he would just throw hay in the windows for the horses to eat. My mom was really freaked out at this point, but he never said anything else similar like that ever again. That's pretty awesome. That's gotta be comforting to remember. Stories like this, I enjoy. It's tame, it's cute, doesn't sound made up or stretched. It makes me believe in the afterlife. Just a, just a touch, just a little bit. Something similar actually happened in my family. My cousin was born not too long after my grandfather had passed, and apparently when he was a toddler, he would say some weird stuff as well. Like he would ask how the kids were, just with a thing of milk in his hand, walking around with no shirt. He's like, hey, how are the kids? I'm like, what kids? You don't have kids? I know for a fact you don't have any kids. I'm your family, that's how I know. He would just go in empty rooms and talk. I mean, hard to say, but I've heard some weird things. Recollections like this convince me, so thanks for sharing. In our number three spot today, we have What's Going On? This is an afterlife story that really had me intrigued because it's like nothing I've ever heard before. It's not the typical tunnel with light at the end or a field of flowers. No. Instead, this person saw a bunch of math. 
I mean, not exactly, but they wrote, quote, Through open doors I glimpsed at enormous rooms filled with complex equipment. In several of the rooms, hooded figures bent over intricate charts and diagrams or sat at the controls of elaborate consoles flickering with lights. I gazed into rooms lined floor to ceiling with documents on parchment, clay, leather, metal, and paper. Here, the thought occurred to me, are assembled the important books of the universe. This afterlife experience happened to Dr. George. George Ritchie, and it really is compelling. Who are these hooded figures? Your guess is as good as mine. What are they up to and what's all this equipment they have? I'll never know. Or maybe we'll all find out. I suppose only time will tell for sure. Number two, new hat, old life. My daughter asked me, remember my fancy hat? And when I said no, she said, yeah, before I was dead, I used to work at a bank. <laughs> at that point, I'd be like, sorry, stop, you're grounded. Stop, go to your room. I saved my money and bought a hat in a round box. I was on the bus and a man almost sat on it. Then the bus crashed and I died. She was about three and totally casual about the whole thing. That was from user Raspberry Sweaty. Also not Sweetie, it's Raspberry Sweaty. I did a double take with that name. Yeah, that's a convincing story because when I was three, I didn't understand money or how it worked. I didn't understand how a bank functions. I mean, to this day, I still don't really know. I don't know, why do they keep calling all the time? What do they want? Also, sorry to hear about your new slash old hat. Hopefully in this life, you got a newer, fancier hat. For her birthday, let's all pitch in and buy her an old timey hat. Worst gift ever for a young child, but she'll know. She'll open it and she'll be like, oh, I remember, the bank. I didn't sign out. In our number one spot today, we have best friend. Okay, this is one story that truly, I think a lot of us hope the afterlife is like, should we all come to find out that there is one? This story is from someone named Bryce Bond, and they wrote, quote, racing toward me as a dog I once had, a black poodle named Pepe. He jumped into my arms, licking my face. I can smell him, feel him, hear his breathing, and sense his great joy at being with me again. Honestly, that sounds a lot like heaven to me. Imagine all the pets you've ever had just waiting there at Rainbow Bridge for you. I mean, I could tear up just thinking about it. That is probably the most comforting story of the afterlife that I've ever heard. Kicking off the list at number 10, the beings. These words came from someone who claimed to see hell during their close call with death. We're off to a hot start, literally, here we go. They said, I remember feeling terrified. It was so cold and I could not see anything below me, so it was hard to figure out what was going on exactly. As the beings pulled me in closer, it seemed squishy and wet, as well as dark and cold. Meanwhile, the beings all around me were ripping and tearing at me. That's horrible. I was thinking that I didn't like this at all and wanted to go back. I do not know what these beings are, nor am I interested in finding out, more than fair. That sounds like the most horrifying experience at this point. Honestly, I'd rather take nothingness at the end of a life, like some others talk about, than this. I can barely handle sleep paralysis demons, let alone demons from the other side. Hard pass for me. Glad you're okay, but... Hard pass. In our number nine spot today, we have The Dream. This Reddit story comes from someone who really knows how to paint quite a vivid picture. This person actually experienced their close call after being impaled with a fillet knife. They go on to write, quote, I had tried to crawl up from my basement to phone 911, but I was so weak and every time I moved, I started bleeding harder. I remember passing out and having the sensation like I was leaving a dark room and moving outside into the sun. I stopped panicking and this feeling of pure contentment settled over me. I was floating over a garden where all of the plants were giving off light and I could see a huge amorphous shape above me that was made up of every color in existence including colors I have never seen before and couldn't possibly describe. The shape seemed familiar like I was a part of it and it was beckoning to me and filling me with pure ecstasy and understanding as I looked at it. Then a man who looked an awful lot like Dream from the Sandman comics, which I was obsessed with at the time, walked over to me through the garden and told me that I couldn't go home yet, that it wasn't time. I started weeping but I was filled with a feeling of understanding like I knew that I had to go back despite not wanting to the man had tears streaming down his face and he took my hand and led me back to my body which was in an ambulance my older brother had found me and called 911 this sounds like while having one of the most horrific experiences this person was having one of the most peaceful and tranquil moments of their entire life it really is interesting what these kinds of experiences can do to our bodies and brains number eight guest appearance this reddit story starts out when the OP was 
was in the middle of having an anaphylactic reaction, and at this point, they had stopped breathing entirely. What an absolute nightmare. They remember having visions and hallucinations during this experience, and once they were healed up, they figured the hallucinations and whatever they saw, they figured that was just part of the reaction. They didn't think much of it at first until they explained to their mom later on what exactly it was that they saw. They saw a middle-aged man who wasn't in scrubs standing at the end of the hospital bed while all the staff was running around and doing their business. I was having a non-verbal conversation with him and he was telling me to calm down and to focus on my breathing. He wore a tropical style button down shirt, one of those old school newsboys hats and had a very pleasant demeanor. Mom then showed me a photo of my grandfather that I'd never seen before and it was the same guy at the foot of my bed and he died before I was even born. So he'd never even seen them, that's crazy. Well, this man has style in the afterlife, it seems, that's pretty wild. Has this happened to anybody else before? Have you experienced any type of reaction where you unconsciously see your family? You probably don't forget something like that, so let us know in the comments down below.